Peter, a renowned mathematician, sat in his study, sipping coffee while reviewing a complex proof he had been working on for months. The stillness of the room was abruptly interrupted by a chime from his phone. He glanced at the screen to see a notification from his bank. His brow furrowed in confusion. You have been debited 5,000 US dollars, read the message. Peter's heart skipped a beat. He hadn't made any such transaction. A quick check on his banking app confirmed the deduction. Panic set in as he racked his brain, trying to remember if he had shared his financial details with anyone recently. But he was meticulous with security, always ensuring his devices were protected. Then, a memory surfaced. Yesterday, he had received a seemingly innocuous Christmas animation in his messenger. It was a short doc gif clip of snowflakes falling and a jolly Santa wishing him Merry Christmas. Without a second thought, Peter had clicked on it. As he watched the animation, his iPhone screen flickered for a brief moment, but everything seemed normal. Peter's fingers hovered over the keyboard, his mind still racing as he decided to check his antivirus app's dashboard. It was a premium version, one of the top-rated security suites specifically designed to shield against the latest threats. He trusted it to protect his digital life. But in light of the recent incident, that trust had been shaken. He opened the app and navigated to the security log. It showed that the last full scan had completed just yesterday, shortly before he received the mysterious animation. According to the log, his iPhone was clean, and all virus definitions were up to date. So why wasn't this caught? He muttered to himself, feeling the weight of the situation pressing down on him. Peter scrolled through the app, looking for any signs of irregularity. He checked the premium features, real-time protection, firewall, phishing detection, identity protection, everything seemed to be functioning as it should. He even reviewed the recent updates and security patches, all of which had been installed without any issues. If the antivirus is up to date and running properly, then what went wrong? He wondered. His mind raced through possibilities. Could this be a completely new kind of malware, something so advanced that it had evaded detection even by the most sophisticated software, or was it possible that the malware had somehow tampered with the antivirus, making it blind to the infection? His paranoia began to rise. He realized he needed more information. Perhaps there were others who had experienced something similar. He checked the App Store for recent reviews of his antivirus app, but there was nothing indicating a widespread issue. No reports of security breaches, no mentions of new viruses or Trojans slipping through the defenses. Peter then expanded his search to security forums and social media. He typed in keywords like iPhone malware Christmas animation and new iPhone Trojan, but still, nothing of relevance came up. It seemed as if no one else had encountered what he was dealing with. He felt more isolated with every passing minute. The possibility that he was among the first to be hit by this threat grew stronger in his mind. A zero-day exploit, he thought again. A vulnerability that hasn't been discovered yet. That would explain why his antivirus hadn't caught it. But if that were the case, the implications were terrifying. It could mean that others were vulnerable too, and they wouldn't even know it until it was too late. Peter decided to perform a manual scan on his phone, hoping that somehow it would pick up on something the automatic scans had missed. The scan took longer than usual, each minute feeling like an eternity as he watched the progress bar inch forward. Finally, the scan completed. No threats found, the screen displayed. Peter stared at the screen, frustrated. The logical part of his brain told him that this should be reassuring. After all, the antivirus claimed his device was safe, but another part of him couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. There was no explanation for the missing money, and no explanation for the flicker on his phone screen after clicking the animation. Unsure of what to do next, Peter decided to dig deeper into his phone's activity logs. He accessed the developer settings and looked at recent system events. His eyes scanned through lines of code, searching for anything unusual, any unknown processes that could indicate something sinister running in the background. But nothing stood out. Everything looked normal. Yet, despite all his efforts, the anxiety gnawed at him. What if this malware is designed to be invisible? What if it's sophisticated enough to hide from even the most advanced detection methods? His thoughts spiraled further. If this virus was truly new, it could be spreading undetected. His personal data, financial information, even his academic work, all could be at risk. And not just for him, but for anyone else who might unknowingly fall victim to the same trap. Feeling cornered, Peter made a decision. He called one of his colleagues, a cybersecurity expert named Dr. Elena Ross, who had worked with law enforcement on high-profile hacking cases. Elena, Peter said, trying to keep the panic out of his voice as he explained the situation, I need your help. I think I've been hit by something, something new. 
There was a pause on the other end of the line before Elena responded. Peter, send me everything you've got. Screenshots, logs, any files you received. I'll analyze them. If this is a new virus or Trojan, we need to act fast before it spreads. Peter felt a wave of relief wash over him. At least now, he wasn't alone in this fight. Peter wasted no time. His heart pounded as he dialed the number for his bank's telebanking service. The wait felt agonizingly long, but finally, a calm voice answered on the other end. Thank you for calling. How may I assist you today? Peter quickly explained the situation, detailing the unauthorized transaction. I need to freeze my account immediately, he added urgently. There's a chance my phone's been compromised, and I can't risk further breaches. The representative acknowledged the seriousness of the situation. Within minutes, they confirmed that his account had been frozen, preventing any additional withdrawals or transactions. Peter felt a slight sense of relief, knowing that at least his financial assets were secure for the time being. Is there anything else we can assist you with? The representative asked. Peter thought for a moment. Could you please initiate a full investigation into the transaction? I'm concerned this might be part of a larger issue. We'll escalate this to our fraud team right away, the representative assured him. You'll hear from them within the next 48 hours. After ending the call, Peter turned his attention back to his phone. He compiled everything he could think of, the suspicious Christmas animation, screenshots of his banking app showing the unauthorized transaction, logs from his antivirus scans, and the recent system events he had reviewed earlier. He zipped the files together and attached them to an email address to Dr. Elena Ross, his tech-savvy friend who had already agreed to help. In the email, he included a detailed account of everything that had happened, from the moment he clicked on the animation to the flicker on his screen, to the strange debit from his bank account. He trusted Elena's expertise, she had a sharp mind for uncovering hidden digital threats, and if anyone could get to the bottom of this, it was her. With the email sent, Peter sat back in his chair, exhaling deeply. There was nothing more he could do for now. His finances were on hold, and the investigation was in motion. All that was left was to wait for Elena's analysis. But as he stared at the screen, Peter couldn't shake the fear gnawing at him. What if this was bigger than a simple virus or Trojan? What if it was something more complex, an evolving threat targeting people like him, who valued their privacy and security above all else? Peter's mind drifted back to his mathematics. The logical patterns he normally took comfort in now seemed distant. His world, which was usually so orderly and precise, felt chaotic and unpredictable. He glanced out the window at the quiet street outside, but inside his mind, a storm was brewing. The minutes ticked by, each one stretching longer than the last, until finally, his phone chimed. It was an email from Elena. Got everything you sent, the message read. I'm diving in now. We'll keep you posted. Stay safe, Peter. This could be bigger than we thought. Peter's anxiety intensified. Bigger than we thought. He had feared as much, but seeing it confirmed in Elena's words sent a chill down his spine. His fingers twitched restlessly as he stared at the email, waiting for the next update from Elena. He knew it might take hours, or even days, for her to uncover anything concrete. But in the meantime, Peter realized, his life was on hold. His proof, the banking investigation, and his personal security, all intertwined in a web of uncertainty. With nothing else to do but wait, Peter decided to take a walk around the neighborhood. He needed to clear his head and regain some sense of control. The cool air outside felt refreshing, but as he walked, he couldn't help but feel like the world had become a little darker, a little more dangerous. And as much as he tried to focus on the sound of his footsteps, his thoughts kept drifting back to his phone, wondering what Elena might discover next. As evening descended, Peter sat in his study, the room dimly lit by the soft glow of his desk lamp. He had been unable to focus on his work all day, his mind consumed with worry about the mysterious transaction and the potential security breach. Every time his phone buzzed, his heart raced, but it was always just a spam email or a routine notification. Finally, his phone rang, cutting through the silence. It was Elena. He answered immediately, his voice tense. Elena, what did you find? On the other end, Elena's voice was calm but carried an undertone of concern. Peter, I went through everything, the GIF, the logs, all of it. The animation file is clean. It's just a regular holiday greeting, no malicious code embedded. I checked your phone's log data too, and nothing looks out of place. Whatever caused this wasn't triggered by that file or anything that's visible on your system. Peter felt a knot in his stomach. So, what does that mean? How did they get access to my account? Elena sighed. This isn't something simple, Peter. If the usual signs aren't there, it's likely a more sophisticated hack. 
it could be some new kind of exploit that hasn't been documented yet, something that bypasses the traditional methods of detection, a zero-day attack, or maybe a highly targeted phishing scheme that tricked the system into thinking everything was fine. Peter slumped back in his chair, running a hand through his hair, but my antivirus is up to date. I've been so careful, I know, Elena replied gently, but the attackers are getting smarter. It's possible they found a way around the latest defenses, using techniques that haven't been seen before. It's rare, but not impossible. You might have been an early target, someone they were specifically looking for, or it could just be bad luck. An early target? Peter asked, the idea unnerving him. Why me? Elena paused before responding. It could be random, or it could be that they are looking for specific profiles, people with strong security practices, who won't notice until it's too late. Maybe even people in fields like yours, who deal with sensitive data or high-level intellectual work. There's a chance this isn't just about money, Peter. It could be something deeper. Peter's mind raced, replaying everything from the past few days. Could his work on advanced mathematical theories have drawn attention? He had always believed his work to be abstract and far removed from anything that could be commercially valuable or a target for espionage. But in the world of cyber attacks, nothing seemed too far-fetched anymore. So what do we do now? Peter asked, trying to keep his voice steady. I'm going to escalate this to a few contacts in the cybersecurity world, Elena said. People who specialize in tracking down these kinds of advanced threats. I'll also be keeping an eye on any emerging reports that could match your case. In the meantime, you've done the right thing by freezing your account and changing your passwords. But stay vigilant, Peter. If this really is something new, we need to be ready for anything. Peter nodded, even though she couldn't see him. Thanks, Elena. I appreciate your help. Of course, she replied. I'll keep you updated as soon as I hear anything more. And Peter, take care of yourself. I know this is stressful, but we'll get to the bottom of it. They said their goodbyes, and Peter hung up the phone. He sat there for a moment, staring into the darkness outside the window. The conversation with Elena had confirmed his fears, this wasn't a simple mistake or a glitch in the system. Something more complex and dangerous was at play. Peter tried to refocus on his work, but the equations and proofs that once captivated him now seemed trivial compared to the looming threat. He couldn't shake the feeling that this was only the beginning of something much larger, something that could affect not just him, but countless others who had yet to realize they were vulnerable. As the night wore on, Peter's thoughts shifted from panic to determination. He was a mathematician, trained to solve problems, no matter how complex. And this was just another problem, one that he would approach with the same methodical precision that had guided his career. He took a deep breath, pulled out a fresh sheet of paper, and began mapping out possible scenarios. If this was indeed a new hack, then somewhere within the complexity of the attack lay the solution. All he had to do was find the pattern, the logic behind it, and unravel it step by step and as he worked into the night, the shadows of uncertainty that had hung over him began to lift, replaced by the clarity of a mind determined to find the truth, no matter how elusive it might be. Peter sat in the stillness of his study, the weight of uncertainty pressing down on him. With Elena's words echoing in his mind, he knew that the only way forward was to dissect every action he had taken in the past few months. He needed to identify the moment the breach occurred. He closed his eyes and began to retrace his steps. Since Easter, life had been relatively routine, teaching, research, and occasional meetings with colleagues. Apart from those regular activities, he hadn't used his banking app much. Groceries, he thought, that was the only time he had made transactions recently, and he always used the same trusted merchant. Peter trusted the grocery store's point-of-sale POS system implicitly. The store was well-known, with state-of-the-art security measures in place. Their systems were regularly audited, their encryption standards among the highest in the industry. There was no way their security could have been broken. The breach, if it had occurred during one of his transactions, had to have happened somewhere else, in transmission, perhaps. His mind raced. If the problem wasn't with the store or the bank itself, then it had to be during the transmission of the data. That meant his private key, the cryptographic key used to secure his communications, had somehow been compromised. The thought was terrifying. Private keys were designed to be unbreakable, protected by layers of encryption that only the most sophisticated algorithms could even attempt to crack. But if someone had found a way to break his private key, it would explain everything. The hacker could have intercepted his data during a routine transaction and decrypted it, allowing them to siphon funds from his account without leaving any trace. Peter's stomach twisted at the realization. His private key being compromised meant that someone had access to everything, his financial transactions, his communications, and potentially even more sensitive data. 
This wasn't just about a single debit from his bank account. This was about his entire digital life being laid bare to an unknown entity. But how? How could they have broken the key? He kept his system up to date, used strong passwords, and followed all the best practices. He wasn't some careless user, he was meticulous about his digital security. Peter stood up, pacing the room. Could there be a flaw in the encryption algorithm itself? Was it possible that someone had discovered a new method of breaking encryption that the world wasn't aware of yet? Or could it have been something more insidious, like a man-in-the-middle attack that intercepted his data as it was being transmitted from the POS system to the bank? His mind buzzed with questions, but none of them had easy answers. He knew that encryption standards were evolving all the time, and that researchers were constantly finding new vulnerabilities. But if his private key had truly been compromised, this was bigger than just him. It could be part of a wider attack on the very foundations of digital security. Peter's thoughts were interrupted by another email notification. It was from Elena. Peter, I've been doing some more digging. There's no chatter on the usual forums about any new viruses or trojans, but I found a few obscure references to something that might be connected. It's still in the early stages, but there are rumors about a new exploit targeting secure transmission protocols. It's not confirmed yet, but it's being called Quantum Mirage. I'll keep looking, but this could be related to what you're dealing with. Stay vigilant. Peter's breath caught in his throat. Quantum Mirage. The name alone sent a shiver down his spine. If Elena was right, and this exploit targeted secure transmissions, it could explain how his private key was broken. But it also meant that this wasn't just a personal attack, it was part of something much larger, something that could potentially disrupt secure communications on a global scale. He sat back down, his hands trembling slightly as he typed out a response to Elena. Keep me posted. If this is related, we need to figure out how they are doing it. I'll dig into the encryption standards on my end and see if there's been any recent research that might explain this. And Elena, thanks again. I'm not sure what I'd do without your help. After hitting send, Peter leaned back in his chair and took a deep breath. He knew what he had to do next. He couldn't just sit and wait for answers to come to him. He needed to be proactive, to dive into the research and uncover any clues that might lead to the source of this attack. He opened his laptop, pulling up the latest papers on encryption vulnerabilities, quantum computing, and secure transmission protocols. If there was a flaw out there, something that could have compromised his private key, he would find it. And when he did, he would make sure that no one else fell victim to this kind of attack. But as he began his search, Peter couldn't help but feel a lingering sense of dread. If quantum mirage was real, and it could bypass even the most secure encryption methods, then the world was facing a new era of cyber warfare, one where the old rules no longer applied, and the line between safety and vulnerability was thinner than ever before. As Peter scoured the depths of encryption research, trying to find any clues that could explain the breach of his private key, his browser suddenly pinged with a notification. Google had recommended some videos, their thumbnails popping up on the side of his screen. He glanced at them absent-mindedly, already overwhelmed by the sea of information he was sifting through, but one thumbnail caught his eye. It was from a YouTube channel with the handle at Usolva. Peter didn't recognize the name, but it seemed to be related to mathematics and computer science, areas he was very familiar with. Curiosity got the better of him, and he clicked on the channel. The page loaded, revealing a series of videos, many of which were dense with mathematical notation, graphs, and long-winded explanations about prime numbers, cryptography, and complex algorithms. Peter skimmed through a few, but nothing seemed particularly groundbreaking. The comment sections were filled with the usual chatter, some praising the creator's insight, others dismissing the content as overhyped nonsense. Just as Peter was about to close the tab and move on, something at the bottom of the page grabbed his attention. It was a very recent post, Beware World, Prime Factorization Algorithm is Cracked. Peter's heart skipped a beat. He quickly clicked on the video, his mind racing. Prime factorization was the backbone of many cryptographic systems, including the RSA encryption algorithm, which relied on the difficulty of factoring large prime numbers. If someone had found a way to crack that, it could potentially undermine the entire foundation of modern digital security. The video began with a blurry shot of an Excel file filled with formulas. A voiceover, distorted and almost robotic, explained how a new algorithm had allegedly been discovered, a method for efficiently factoring large prime numbers. The details were vague, and the presentation was far from polished, but the implications were clear. If this was real, it could change everything. Peter leaned in closer, absorbing every word. The narrator spoke of an exploit that could break the RSA encryption scheme in minutes, using a combination of advanced mathematical techniques and quantum computing principles. 
the video claimed that the algorithm was so efficient that even the largest RSA keys, previously thought to be unbreakable, could be factored in a fraction of the time. As the video played, Peter's skepticism grew. It sounded almost too sensational, like the kind of conspiracy theory that popped up in fringe corners of the internet. But then the narrator dropped a bombshell, this is not just a theoretical breakthrough. It's already been tested through VBA macros in limited scale he could afford. He warned the world, any kind of unexplained financial breaches and mysterious hacks could be the early signs of this algorithm in action. Stay vigilant. The world is about to change. Peter froze. His mind flashed back to his own situation, the unexplained debit from his bank account, the mysterious breach of his private key, Elena's mention of the rumored quantum mirage. Could it be possible that this new prime factorization algorithm was responsible? Could he be one of the first victims of an attack that the world didn't even know existed yet? He quickly scrolled through the comments, hoping to find more information, but there was little to go on. A few users expressed disbelief, while others echoed the warnings of the video. One comment stood out, if this is true, it's the end of RSA as we know it. Quantum computing just took a terrifying leap forward. Peter's hands trembled as he closed the video. His mind raced with possibilities. Could this video be the missing piece of the puzzle? Could this new algorithm explain the breach that had compromised his account? He grabbed his phone and dialed Elena's number. She picked up on the second ring. Elena, I just saw something you need to know about, Peter said, his voice urgent. He quickly explained the video, the claims about the prime factorization algorithm, and how it might be linked to the breach he had experienced. Elena listened carefully, then responded with a mixture of caution and concern. Peter, if this is real, we're dealing with something unprecedented. I'll look into this at the Solver channel and see what I can find. But be careful. If this algorithm is in the wild, we're looking at a massive security crisis. It's not just about your account anymore. This could be global. Peter nodded, though she couldn't see him. I know. I just hope we're not already too late. After hanging up, Peter sat in silence, the weight of the situation pressing down on him. He knew that the world of cryptography was built on the assumption that certain problems, like prime factorization, were too difficult to solve efficiently. But if that assumption had been shattered, then nothing was safe. Peter stared at his screen, feeling a chill run down his spine. The digital world had always felt abstract, a world of ones and zeros, equations, and encryption. But now, it was all too real. And somewhere, out there in the ether, an invisible threat was looming, one that could unravel the very fabric of the modern world. Peter's mind was in overdrive. If the video about the prime factorization algorithm was accurate, it could signal the most significant cryptographic breach of the century. But there was something else that gnawed at him, the person behind the video. He needed to know more about this mysterious YouTube channel. A quick Google search revealed something unexpected. The channel's owner wasn't just making bold claims about cryptography, he had also been working on one of the most famous unsolved problems in mathematics, the Riemann hypothesis. Peter's eyes widened as he clicked on a link leading to an article about this enigmatic figure. The title read, Amateur Mathematician Claims to Have Solved the Riemann Hypothesis, A Breakthrough or Just Another Hoax. The article detailed how the channel owner had publicly shared his work on the Riemann Hypothesis, claiming to have found a proof. The problem, which had baffled mathematicians for over 160 years, was considered one of the most difficult and important in all of mathematics. It dealt with the distribution of prime numbers and had implications across number theory, complex analysis, and even cryptography. What struck Peter most was that the channel owner described himself not as a professional mathematician, but as a math enthusiast with a background in accounting. He wasn't someone who had spent decades in academia, nor did he have the credentials typically associated with such a groundbreaking discovery. How could someone with an accounting background, a discipline rooted in basic algebra and financial calculations, possibly claim to have solved the Riemann hypothesis? Peter felt a mix of skepticism and intrigue. He knew better than anyone that breakthroughs could sometimes come from unexpected places, but this? It seemed too far-fetched. Yet, if there was any truth to the claim, it could explain everything, the prime factorization algorithm, the breach of his private key, and the mention of quantum computing. He scrolled through the article, reading about the supposed proof. The details were vague, but the article mentioned that the solution involved high school level algebra, intuitive leaps, and connections between seemingly unrelated areas of mathematics. The amateur mathematician had even drawn parallels between the Riemann hypothesis and concepts in accounting, such as balance sheets and averaging techniques. Peter couldn't help but feel a sense of disbelief. How could someone with such limited formal mathematical training have made such monumental strides? It didn't make sense. 
and yet, the implications of his work, if valid, could be earth-shattering. He followed a link in the article that led to a PDF of the mathematician's work. The document was surprisingly well-organized, filled with equations and diagrams that seemed far more sophisticated than anything an accountant would typically produce. Peter skimmed through it, noticing references to prime numbers, harmonic analysis, and even some of Euler's work. The notation was unconventional, and some of the arguments felt loose, but there was something undeniably intriguing about it. But as he read on, Peter's skepticism returned. The document was filled with leaps of logic that weren't fully justified, and some of the conclusions seemed too speculative to be taken seriously. Still, he couldn't shake the feeling that there was something here, some hidden truth that was just out of reach. Then it hit him. If this amateur mathematician had indeed cracked the Riemann hypothesis, it would explain why he had also developed a prime factorization algorithm. The two were intimately connected. Solving the Riemann hypothesis would, in theory, provide deep insights into the distribution of prime numbers, insights that could lead to an algorithm capable of factoring large primes with unprecedented efficiency. Peter leaned back in his chair, his mind racing. He had spent years working on the fringes of mathematics, always aware of the boundaries between amateur enthusiasm and professional rigor. But this, this felt different. This wasn't just an amateur playing with equations in his spare time. This was someone who had potentially stumbled onto something monumental, something that could change the course of cryptography, mathematics, and technology as a whole. He picked up his phone and dialed Elena again. When she answered, he quickly filled her in on what he had discovered. Elena, this isn't just some random hacker. This guy claims to have solved the Riemann hypothesis. If he's right, he might have figured out a way to crack prime factorization algorithms using that knowledge. There was a pause on the other end of the line before Elena responded, her voice tinged with disbelief. Peter, that's insane. But if it's true, this changes everything. I know, Peter replied. We need to take this seriously. I'm going to dig deeper into his work, see if there's anything to it. If he's right, then we're dealing with a completely new threat, a mathematical breakthrough that could redefine everything we know about cryptography. After hanging up, Peter stared at his screen, his thoughts swirling. He had spent his career in pursuit of mathematical truth, always seeking answers to questions that seemed just out of reach. But now, standing on the edge of something potentially groundbreaking, he felt a mix of excitement and fear. If this amateur mathematician had truly cracked the Riemann hypothesis, then the world of numbers, and everything built upon it was about to change forever. Peter couldn't help but chuckle as he began scrolling through the PDF, scanning the mathematical scribbles of the self-proclaimed Riemann hypothesis solver. The audacity of it all. He paused at a section labeled dual unit circle, where the author described a bizarre mathematical structure involving two intertwined circles, supposedly solving complex problems of symmetry within the Riemann set of function. It was like watching a child try to reassemble a watch using only duct tape and glue. The paper continued with odd terminology, such as periodical harmonics at a function, which seemed to imply some strange periodic behavior that supposedly bridged Euler's original z function and some harmonic conjugate. Peter was familiar with the beauty and complexity of Euler's work, but this, this was a far cry from any serious mathematical approach. Then there was the section on gamma of x-2, x-3. Peter had to stifle a laugh. The author had managed to take one of the most fundamental concepts in mathematical analysis and twist it into an unintelligible mess. The gamma function was crucial in so many areas, from probability theory to complex analysis, but this paper treated it like a toy to be manipulated without care for the consequences. And just when Peter thought he had seen the worst, he stumbled upon the notion of inverse factorials being negative factorials. The author seemed to be struggling to reconcile the fact that factorials don't have inverses in the way multiplication does. The attempt to invert the factorial function and create some sort of negative counterpart was, at best, misguided. But the height of madness came when Peter reached the final section, where the author made the outrageous claim that the imaginary unit, i, was somehow connected to the natural logarithm of 2. This was the point where Peter burst out laughing. He had seen amateur mathematicians make bold claims before, but this, this was pure fantasy. Imaginary numbers had a well-established role in complex analysis, but trying to redefine them as logarithmic values was absurd. Despite the laughter, Peter couldn't shake a feeling of unease. The paper was amateurish and filled with nonsensical ideas, but something about it lingered in his mind. Could there be a small grain of truth hidden beneath all the madness? He had seen unorthodox approaches before, ideas that seemed foolish at first but later revealed themselves to contain profound insights. His laughter faded as the weight of the situation returned. 
What if this amateur mathematician had stumbled onto something real without even realizing it? What if the nonsense in the paper was masking a deeper truth? He couldn't dismiss it entirely, especially not after everything that had happened. Peter knew that he couldn't afford to ignore the possibility, no matter how unlikely it seemed. He needed to dig deeper, to understand whether there was something, anything, of value in this chaotic mess of ideas. Peter's amusement began to wane as he read further. The formula seemed more sophisticated than he had initially thought. The amateurish presentation was full of unconventional ideas that, upon closer inspection, seemed to be rooted in something deeper. One equation stood out in particular, pi raised to the power of 4 equals 100. At first, it seemed absurd, but then Peter recalled some advanced work involving the Riemann zeta function and pi raised to even powers, perhaps the author was drawing on this, albeit in a crude way. Next, he encountered a formula involving pi raised to the power of j times e equaling negative 1, where j appeared to be another complex number, supposedly representing the natural logarithm of negative 1. The author had even gone so far as to call it a perfect reflection of Euler's identity which tied together exponentials and trigonometric functions in such a beautiful and profound way. Peter leaned back in his chair, no longer laughing. What if this wasn't a simple amateur's work? What if this person had stumbled onto something real, some new insight that hadn't yet been formalized in the standard mathematical lexicon? The strange concepts and unusual approaches might be masking a deeper intuition. Could it be that the real issue was simply in the presentation, not the underlying ideas? He looked again at the formula involving j and negative 1. Was this truly nonsense, or was there a kernel of truth hidden within it? Euler's identity, after all, had once seemed mysterious and magical until mathematicians had fully unraveled its beauty. Perhaps this paper, with all its oddities, was grappling with something similar. Peter decided to sleep on it. He'd been through enough that day, between the fear of losing his money, the sudden revelation about the crack prime factorization algorithm, and this baffling paper. His mind needed rest. As he settled into bed, he felt a strange sense of relief. Somehow, in the chaos of it all, the tension that had gripped him since receiving that fraudulent bank notification had eased. His techie friend had found no signs of malware on his phone, and the situation with the banking password didn't seem as dire as before. Now, all that remained was this curious mystery of the amateur mathematician. Peter's mind buzzed with thoughts of prime numbers, logarithms, and dual unit circles as he drifted into sleep. Somewhere in that mix, he felt, was a clue to something important. Tomorrow, with a clearer head, he would decide how to proceed. As Peter strolled through the quiet, early morning streets on his routine walk, his mind was still buzzing with thoughts from the previous night. The crisp air helped to clear his head, and he began reflecting on the strange ideas from the paper that had consumed his attention. At first, it seemed like nonsense, but now, seeing it from another angle, it wasn't all that bad. After all, the idea of stitching two-dimensional Riemann surfaces together and introducing branch cuts, which were standard in complex analysis, had always seemed a bit incomplete to him. Wasn't it just a patchwork approach to deal with the fundamental problems of multivalued functions? If there was another complex number representing the natural logarithm of negative 1 that could potentially resolve some of the limitations associated with branch cuts, the thought lingered. Why hadn't we ever considered another complex number for the natural logarithm of negative 1? The more Peter pondered it, the more he began to see the merit in such an idea. The traditional approach of handling these complexities with branch cuts worked well enough, but it was an incomplete solution, a clever workaround rather than a true resolution. Then the thought struck him, imaginary number i being the natural logarithm of 2, that was the part he couldn't accept. But why not? He had just entertained the idea of another complex number for the natural logarithm of negative 1, so why couldn't this strange notion of i being ln 2 be equally valid? After all, if everything related to complex numbers and logarithms moved dynamically within the framework, why should the traditional fixed interpretations hold him back? Suddenly, it clicked. He understood where the author of the paper was coming from. The boy wasn't merely playing with odd ideas, he was attempting to use some form of translation and transformation that dragged the entire framework of complex analysis into a new, three-dimensional context. This transformation was designed to fit the puzzle pieces together, addressing not just branch cuts but the deeper pain points and incompleteness in current mathematics. Peter stopped in his tracks. He could see it now, this amateur mathematician was using a different kind of reasoning, one that wasn't bound by the conventional structures of mathematics. He was approaching the Riemann hypothesis and complex numbers with a broader, more dynamic perspective, one that sought to resolve the inherent limitations that Peter and others had simply worked around for years. 
the idea that every related concept should move dynamically made sense in this context. The Boyes framework wasn't about static equations but about fluid relationships between numbers, complex planes, and logarithmic properties. It was an attempt to pull together various mathematical problems into a coherent, multidimensional structure. Peter resumed walking, feeling both intrigued and unsettled. This young enthusiast, with his rudimentary math skills, might have stumbled onto something profound. Was it possible that this translation of ideas could unlock the mysteries of the Riemann hypothesis? Of course. Let's pick up right where we left off. As Peter resumed his walk, his mind raced through the implications of what he had realized. This young enthusiast wasn't simply rearranging existing mathematical ideas, he was trying to fundamentally alter how they interacted, creating a more fluid, dynamic system that could, potentially, resolve some of the deepest mysteries in mathematics. The notion of introducing another complex number for the natural logarithm of negative 1 seemed less absurd now. It was an attempt to rethink the very foundations of complex analysis, and perhaps it was the key to addressing the incompleteness that had nagged at Peter for years. The idea that everything could be translated and transformed into a three-dimensional framework felt revolutionary. It was as if this young amateur had intuitively understood that current mathematical structures, while functional, were like old machinery, effective, but clunky and prone to breakdowns when pushed to their limits. As he approached the park, Peter began to see how this approach could address the Riemann hypothesis. The dual unit circles, the transformations, the rethinking of complex logarithms, all of it could be part of a larger scheme to resolve the problems that had stymied mathematicians for over a century. But could it really be that simple? Could a non-professional mathematician, armed with little more than accounting-level math and intuition, solve one of the most famous unsolved problems in mathematics? Peter had his doubts, but he couldn't ignore the possibility that there might be something here. He made a mental note to revisit the paper when he got back home. Maybe there was a way to strip away the oddities and find the core idea that the boy was trying to express. There had to be something in there, something worth understanding. Peter took a deep breath. For the first time in days, he felt a strange sense of excitement. The fear of losing his money and his frustration over the potential breach of his bank account had faded. Now, his mind was consumed by the possibility of a breakthrough. Maybe this young amateur was onto something after all. With renewed energy, Peter finished his walk, eager to dive back into the paper and explore the ideas he had once dismissed. Back home, Peter brewed himself a strong cup of coffee and set the breakfast table. Alongside his meal sat the freshly printed paper. The white sheets seemed harmless enough, but they held ideas that had stirred something in Peter, something he hadn't felt in a long time. He took a bite of toast, then began to methodically read through the paper again. This time, he wasn't rushing. He was looking for the depth behind the strange concepts. The part about factorials caught his attention. Inverse of factorials, the notion had always seemed like an unfinished piece of mathematics. Factorials themselves were so fundamental, yet inverses of factorials had never been fully developed. The idea that this amateur was attempting to introduce an inverse factorial function to extend the domain and smooth out poles felt like an important step forward. The variance involving x-2, x-3 seemed even more intriguing now. Peter had initially dismissed them as clumsy manipulations, but after sleeping on it, he could see their potential. These variations were attacking the existing poles of the gamma and zeta functions, potentially allowing for an expansion of the domain that would go beyond the standard frameworks. If these x-2, x-3 factorial functions could indeed tame the poles, they might open up entirely new avenues in complex analysis, ways to navigate around the singularities that had always caused trouble. Peter could see the possibility of these functions acting as a bridge, smoothing over the gaps in traditional mathematics. He took another sip of coffee, reflecting on how these new ideas could tackle long-standing problems. Poles, after all, were critical in understanding the behavior of complex functions. If this amateur had found a way to neutralize them, particularly in something as fundamental as the gamma function, it could be revolutionary. But what intrigued Peter even more was how these ideas tied back to the Riemann hypothesis. The paper wasn't just playing with abstract functions, it was using them as tools to reconfigure the landscape of complex analysis. The expansion of the domain could mean a broader, more unified framework that didn't rely on patchwork solutions like branch cuts. The implications were enormous. If these ideas could hold, they could remove the obstacles that had plagued the field for years, making the zeros of the Riemann zeta function clearer and more accessible. Peter found himself scribbling notes in the margins of the paper. Questions and ideas flowed freely now. What if this kid really was onto something? 
He had dismissed the boy's work at first, but now he couldn't help but think that there was something here, something that could change everything. As Peter was absorbed in his thoughts, the ringing of his phone jolted him back to reality. It was his friend, the tech expert who had helped him freeze his bank account earlier. Peter, his friend said, sounding unusually tense, it's not just you, I've been hearing about more cases all day, and it's not just money, it's worse. Peter put his pen down, a feeling of unease creeping back over him. What do you mean? His friend sighed. There's a guy with millions of followers who lost his Twitter account, and now his profile is being used to spread hate speech to youth groups. It's causing real damage. Then there's someone who had their entire Demat account drained. Lifetime savings in shares, gone. It's like these attacks are hitting people on every front. Peter's stomach twisted as he listened. The cases were escalating, becoming more personal and devastating. He could hear the weight of it in his friend's voice. And that's not all, his friend continued. One of the cases involved a Hollywood celebrity. They found out that their entire medical history was hacked from a service provider's server. Now, all their personal details, everything from medical conditions to private appointments, are floating around on social media. It's a complete mess. Peter leaned back in his chair, the gravity of the situation sinking in. This wasn't just a financial scam, this was something much bigger. Identities were being hijacked, lives disrupted, and private information exposed to the world. This was a full-scale attack on people's lives. His mind raced. Could it all be connected? Was this the work of a new, sophisticated form of malware or virus that nobody had seen before? But how? There were no signs, no alerts, just subtle, devastating breaches. Peter felt his pulse quicken. The strange animation he had received, the flicker on his phone screen, it had seemed so innocuous. But now, with everything his friend was telling him, it was clear that this was no ordinary attack. And it wasn't just affecting random people, it was hitting those with significant online and financial presences. Was someone specifically targeting high-profile individuals? Have you heard anything from the tech community? Peter asked, trying to steady his voice. Any idea what's going on? His friend hesitated. Nothing solid yet. Everyone's scrambling to figure it out, but it's moving fast. The usual defenses aren't working, antivirus, firewalls, all of it. This thing is slipping through without leaving much of a trace. Some people are even speculating that it's exploiting a vulnerability in the encryption algorithms themselves. Peter's thoughts immediately jumped back to the paper he had been reading, the prime factorization algorithm being cracked. Could it be related? Could someone have found a way to break encryption at the most fundamental level, using mathematics? I need to dig deeper, Peter muttered, half to himself. What was that? His friend asked. Nothing. Just, let me know if you hear anything else, Peter replied quickly, his mind already racing ahead. Peter hung up the phone, his mind buzzing with urgency. He glanced over at the paper on his desk, the amateur mathematician's work that had seemed, at first, like an eccentric exercise in abstract theory. But now, with the escalating reports of breaches and the unsettling notion that encryption might be cracked, Peter couldn't ignore the possibility that there was a connection. I need to see the proof, Peter muttered to himself. He needed to go beyond the surface-level strangeness of the dual unit circles and inverse factor riles. He needed to dive deep into this kid's work, find the core, and understand how it might connect to the real world, to the sudden breakdown of security systems that had been thought unbreakable. He took another sip of his now lukewarm coffee, placed the paper neatly in front of him, and began reading through it with renewed focus. The abstracts, the equations, the connection to reality. As Peter scanned the formulas, he realized that this wasn't just some abstract manipulation of numbers. The kid had been talking about translating and transforming the entire mathematical framework into a three-dimensional model. Peter had dismissed it at first as nonsense, but now it seemed like an effort to rethink how mathematics could be applied in the real world, particularly in cryptography and encryption. The use of the Riemann zeta function and its connection to prime numbers caught his attention again. The way the young mathematician was playing with the zeta function wasn't typical of an amateur, it was sophisticated. He was exploring the zeros of the function in a way that seemed to blur the lines between abstract theory and something far more practical. The suggestion that prime factorization could be cracked suddenly seemed less ridiculous. The focus on periodic harmonic functions and removing poles, this wasn't just about solving abstract problems. What if this method of smoothing out complex functions had real-world implications, like smoothing out encryption? What if this kid had unknowingly stumbled onto a method that could break the backbone of modern security systems? Peter's heart raced as he flipped through more pages. 
the formula that had seemed absurd, pi to the power of j times e equals minus 1 now seemed like a twisted but brilliant reflection of Euler's identity. What if these transformations weren't just about neat mathematical tricks, but about altering the very nature of encryption and prime numbers? And then the thought hit him, what if this kid didn't even realize the implications of his work? What if, in his pursuit of solving one of the greatest mathematical problems of all time, he had inadvertently unlocked something dangerous, something that could unravel the fabric of modern cryptography? Peter leaned back in his chair, his mind racing. He needed to get in touch with the young mathematician. He had to know whether this was intentional, or if the kid was as oblivious to the real-world consequences as he seemed. Peter grabbed his laptop, opened his email, and began typing furiously. Peter's fingers paused over the keyboard as the realization dawned on him. If this kid had come so far in his exploration of complex mathematical concepts, then he must have developed some level of clarity about prime numbers. Prime factorization, after all, was the key to modern encryption, and if the boy had cracked that, then everything Peter feared might already be in motion. He closed his email draft and switched back to the browser, pulling up the YouTube channel with the handle at Wasolva. The video titled Beware World, Prime Factorization Algorithm is Cracked, hovered at the top of the page. Peter clicked on it, feeling a mixture of dread and anticipation. Peter's eyes widened as he watched the video. This wasn't the typical mathematical exposition he was expecting. Instead of complicated formulas scribbled on a whiteboard, the video showed a screen recording of an Excel sheet running a VBA macro. The title of the macro read ghost underscore algorithm dot xlsm and in the background, Peter could see columns of numbers flickering, being processed at lightning speed. The text-to-speech voice was calm and measured as he explained his process. What you're seeing, he said, is a function I developed that matches prime numbers to their unique DNA signatures. I call it the sum of digits method. It's simple, really. By summing the digits of large numbers, I can map out their prime factorization. Peter leaned in closer. The Excel macro was outputting results in real time, relatively huge numbers were being broken down into their prime components almost instantly. The function appeared to be effortless pulling apart the primes from the composite numbers, revealing the factors with an eerie precision. What a hack, man, Peter muttered under his breath. This kid wasn't just performing traditional prime factorization, he was exploiting some sort of pattern in the digits themselves, a trick that bypassed conventional methods entirely. The idea that a seemingly trivial function like summing the digits could crack something as complex as prime numbers was both brilliant and terrifying. The voice continued, this works by isolating the unique sum of digits that correlates to a prime signature. Every prime has a pattern hidden within its digits, and once you know what to look for, it's just a matter of matching that pattern, like DNA matching. Peter watched as the Excel macro churned through larger and larger numbers, effortless decomposing them into primes. The speed at which it worked was astonishing, especially considering that traditional methods struggled with numbers of this size. This wasn't just an algorithm, it was a hack, a shortcut that seemed to defy the very complexity of prime factorization. I have taken the first step in building the foundation of my algorithm by plotting the first 1 million primes in an Excel column. This gives me a structured set of prime numbers to work with, which serves as the backbone of my algorithm. Additionally, in another column, I've calculated the square roots of the prime numbers. This is a crucial step because it allows me to bound my search areas when factoring numbers. By knowing the square roots of the primes, I can set logical limits on where the factors are likely to be found, improving both the speed and accuracy of the algorithm. Also while checking the actual results we can retrieve the prime just by squaring and taking the integer part of it. For now, square roots will suffice. If we ever need to find primes with trillions of digits, or even larger primes, we could use natural logarithms to compress information about primes. Decimal precision shouldn't be an issue, as we already have databases capable of handling billion-digit precision. Next, using VBA functions, I have generated the sum of the digits four multiples of these primes, specifically, two times, three times, and six times the primes. These sums act as prime seeds in my algorithm. Rather than using the full digits of the primes, I preferred using square roots as the referring point for the algorithm. This simplifies the process without losing essential information for factorization. To identify the correspondence between the seeds and the original primes, I've used the prime index number. This way, each seed can be traced back to its prime through the index and its square roots, which keeps the algorithm organized and efficient. With these inputs set up, prime numbers, prime seeds, prime index numbers, and square root bounds, I have completed the input requirements for my algorithm. 
This is all the data needed to get the process started, and from here, the algorithm can efficiently factorize numbers by leveraging these inputs. In the processing cells, I begin by taking a random number that can be generated using Excel's randBetween function. I am fully aware that there are primes with trillions of digits and that even RSA primes are much larger than what I can handle in Excel. However, my goal here is to demonstrate the program flow. Once the structure of my algorithm is understood, scaling it up will not be an issue. The key concept is that my prime seeds, derived from the sum of digits of multiples of primes, have logarithmic growth. This growth rate allows the seeds to directly tackle the exponential growth of larger numbers. By starting with a random number, I can demonstrate how the algorithm will use these seeds to efficiently factorize numbers. This approach is scalable and adaptable to much larger datasets beyond Excel, making it a robust solution in more advanced implementations. I calculated both the square root and the natural logarithm of the generated random number to set the upper bound for my search limit. These values also help me calculate the estimated number of trial divisions required to factorize the number using classical tools such as than sieving techniques and other logarithmic bound-based sieving methods. While the exact formula for calculating this number may be open to debate, my focus here is not on undermining other algorithms. Instead, I'm showcasing the efficiency of my algorithm. If someone chooses to arbitrarily scale down my calculated efficiency ratio, I won't mind, I deliberately set a minimum efficiency of 1000% because that was the challenge I took on and promised to present in my YouTube opinion poll. The goal of my demonstration is to prove that the algorithm's efficiency remains strong even when scaled, and that it can handle more extensive datasets effectively once moved out of Excel into a more professional software environment. I used three seed series in my algorithm, derived from two times, three times, and six times the primes, because this is the maximum number of series Excel can handle efficiently on one million primes using all its parallel processing threads. Theoretically, this number can be scaled infinitely, constrained only by software and hardware limitations. I can easily visualize that with just 10 seed series, humanity could generate as many prime numbers as there are particles in the observable universe. Although 3 seed series is not the bare minimum, I chose this number because it effectively captures all the essential flavors of primes. It acts like a tripod that can stand stably on any surface, just as these 3 seed series can provide a balanced and comprehensive approach to factorization. This approach demonstrates the flexibility and adaptability of the algorithm to handle different scenarios, ensuring robustness across various conditions. The number of seed series used and the number of test primes generated after every iteration have an inverse trade-off relationship that plays a crucial role in optimization. As the number of seed series increases, the number of test prime candidates decreases. One could, theoretically, use a single seed and run for a long time, checking an extensive list of prime factors. However, this would significantly extend the processing time and eventually prove to be equivalent of using any classical sieving techniques. Optimizing this balance is a challenge because there are multiple trade-offs to consider, software and hardware limitations, memory constraints, processing time, and redundancy marking. In my Excel environment, I wasn't able to implement redundancy marking as efficiently as I would have liked, or rather, I didn't invest much effort in optimizing that aspect at this stage. However, when scaled into a more advanced software environment, these trade-offs will become key considerations in ensuring the algorithm's efficiency. Ultimately, the right optimization strategy will depend on the specific context and constraints, balancing these trade-offs to achieve the most efficient solution. Now, coming back to the processing, the next step is to calculate the same type of seed that our random number is carrying but with different scale factor arguments. For 2x prime scaling I have chosen 27x scaling, similarly 3x versus 72x, 9x versus 99x. This seed is then compared with the seeds of the primes in the table to filter out a significant portion of primes using aid less than or equal to criterion. In other words, primes that have seeds higher than that of the given random number are filtered out. This allows us to reduce the search space effectively, focusing only on primes with comparable seeds to the random number. By doing this, we can streamline the factorization process, ensuring that we are testing only the most relevant prime candidates and eliminating the unnecessary ones early on. This significantly enhances the efficiency of the algorithm by narrowing down the list of potential prime factors. The next step I took was summarizing the test prime candidate and their square roots list in a pivot table. This table organizes retrieve the original primes from its square root so that they can be passed through the mod zero test. 
The primes that successfully pass this test are factors of the chosen random number, though they are not necessarily the exclusive factors. By mod 0 check, I am referring to Excel's mod function. When you divide a number by a potential factor using mod and it returns 0, this indicates that the divisor is indeed a factor of the number. In my algorithm, this is the key check used to determine whether a prime from the candidate list is a factor of the random number. If it passes this test, it is added to the list of factors, helping to refine the factorization and potentially discover new primes. To obtain the exclusive list of prime factors, we need to accumulate results over a few iterations, while ensuring that previously tested primes are marked to avoid redundant checks. Once we hit a null search or obtain a null result in the mod 0 test, we know that the leftover number is also a prime factor. This approach allows the algorithm not only to factorize numbers but also to search for new primes in the process. I know many of you might have lots of questions, but what I've shown is something that any of you can achieve. Why not try doing it yourself? By working through it, you'll feel the beauty of the algorithm and gain valuable insights. Once you've gone through the process, I'll be there to answer your questions. Who knows? You might even come up with a more advanced version of it. I recommend that everyone give it a try in a spreadsheet, following my approach. Here's a list of the key steps we've discussed so far. 1. Input primes plot the first 1 million primes in a column. 2. Generate prime seeds, using VBA functions. Calculate the sum of digits of 2 times, 3 times, and 6 times the primes. These are your prime seeds. 3. Index correspondence, use the prime index numbers to link each seed to its corresponding prime. 4. Square root boundaries, calculate the square roots of the prime numbers or even natural logarithms to cut short the long digit primes information and to set the boundaries for your prime search location. 5. Random number generation, use the rand between function to generate a random number for testing. 6. A set search limits, calculate the square root and natural logarithm of the random number to set the upper bound of your search limit, to estimate the number of trial divisions needed using the sieve of Eratosthenes and logarithmic bound-based sieving techniques. 7. Seed series optimization, balance the number of seed series you apply and the number of test primes you want to generate every iteration for actual testing, considering the inverse trade-off relationship for optimization. 8. Seed comparison. Calculate the 27x, 69x, 99x seeds of your random number and compare it with the seeds of the primes in the table to filter out primes with higher seeds. 9. Pivot table for candidates. Summarize the test prime candidates in a pivot table for further testing. 10. Mod 0 test. Retrieve the actual prime by squaring the roots and use the Excel mod function to check four factors. Primes that pass the mod 0 test are factors of the random number. 11. Accumulate iteration results. To get the exclusive list of factors, accumulate the results of multiple iterations, marking previously tested primes. 12. A null search. Once a null result is obtained in the mod 0 test, the leftover number is also a factor. Use this approach to potentially search for new primes. By following these steps, you'll recreate the algorithm and see its potential firsthand. It feels like frying fish in fish oil as you catch more its oil allow you to fry more fishes. As the initial voting results suggest that everyone wants me to release the algorithm as soon as possible, here's the first cut view of it. I initially tried using ChatGPT to write the algorithm in Python, but the output wasn't helpful. In the end, I had to implement it in Excel VBA, which I knew a little bit. I'll hand over the Excel document as scheduled based on the poll. In the meantime, I would greatly appreciate your valuable feedback on the proposed algorithm. To ensure statutory compliance and avoid unknowingly violating any country's information security laws, comments will be disabled. You can use any previous threads. I invite all of you to participate what could be a groundbreaking discovery of the 21st century. This could potentially scale up to become one of the significant discoveries in history, as prime factorization has captivated humanity since antiquity. Please take individual responsibility to spread the news around the world. Let us advance science together. I initially thought I should die with this knowledge, like Del Ferro intended, but thanks to few of my viewers, I found the motivation to share it. A heartfelt thank you to everyone who encouraged me to share this, voted my poll or still voting. After this, I'll be shutting down my YouTube channel, and I'm looking forward to feeling lighter and returning to my normal life again. I believe that in the 21st century, I should not have to face the same repercussions as Galileo and Copernicus did for releasing groundbreaking ideas. Let us embrace this opportunity and contribute to the progress of science. Hackers and crackers, stay away from this algorithm. Do not use it for cheap money-making.
the time it takes to crack RSA is enough to track your IP address even if you try to mask it, leading to potential legal consequences for such attempts. Internet security and cryptography experts please figure out how to deal with this loophole as soon as possible and strengthen the internet security systems to keep public information safe. Let us focus on using this algorithm for problem solving and advancing scientific knowledge. Smart hackers apply your sharp minds to improve society and contribute to meaningful progress. There are so many unsolved mysteries. You will be rewarded for making positive contributions. Even if all you get are peanuts, take my example, I'm like an alien to this world, yet I've come this far just to tell you all that there's no end to chasing knowledge. Remember, money is not everything. When the day comes, you cannot take your wealth with you, but mathematics and numbers endure. Choose to use your skills for the betterment of humanity rather than for short-term gain. The prime seed and scaling factor used in my algorithm are not arbitrary. They are carefully handpicked based on the knowledge gained from my proof of the Riemann hypothesis. While trying arbitrary numbers may yield results, they often lead to delays as the test prime candidate list grows, increasing processing time. Even though my constants may not work for trillions of digit primes, I will not withhold any secrets, no matter the recognition I receive. You shouldn't worry too much about finding the perfect selection, my algorithm won't deprive you of results, even if you choose scaled up constants of your own. Yet 22x, 33x, 99x4 primes and 273x, 366x, 999x4 the random numbers would give better results. Free limits ends here. IT companies haunting primes can buy my service finding this factors from me. Is the prize for a billion digit prime still available? Having declared that I don't seek monetary prizes for my Riemann hypothesis work but I need to compensate myself for the time I lost. Although it was my personal call to invest time for personal satisfaction, anything beyond this cannot be free. If I get a sponsor I can target trillion digit prime too. Pi decimal places has been calculated up to 62 trillion digits why the primes should left behind. Skeptic viewers still thinking I am bluffing are requested to crack 100 primes on their own using my algorithm before they get the confidence. The mathematics behind this prime factorization algorithm builds on the insights from my work on the Riemann hypothesis, particularly the symmetry and structural relationships I explored. The concept of using prime seeds connects to the symmetrical manipulation around zeta function zeros. The logarithmic growth of the prime seeds is a reflection of the logarithmic bounds in my Riemann hypothesis proof and the notion of harmonic conjugates and, where I use similar principles to manage complexity and optimize calculations. These mathematical foundations ensure that the algorithm is robust and efficient. Knowingly or unknowingly, my algorithm might have touched various mathematical concepts such as modular forward slash clock algebra, prime partitioning, the gold bar conjecture, and even the Collet's conjecture. It also takes into account various other prime and number theory patterns, including palindromes, and also decode Tisler's curiosity to 3-6-9 mystery. Ramanujan's work on partitions, particularly his congruence theorem, could potentially improve the algorithm by offering a deeper understanding of how numbers divide and aggregate, leading to more efficient partitioning methods and advanced prime factorization techniques. I've been inundated with comments, some suggesting that I'm claiming to be a reincarnated Ramanujan. But let me set the record straight, I never considered myself a genius like him. Yet, somewhere deep down, I always believed that my work would eventually catch the eye of at least one hardy. Today, as I stand on the verge of giving up, I find myself asking, where are all the hardies out there? Where are you, hardy? What's your taxicab number today? If it contains 69, remember me. I told you before, it's all a cycle. If you as identity, e to the power i times pi equals minus 1 is the queen of math chessboard then pi to the power j times e equals minus 1 is the king, the piece we're all trying to protect from checkmate. Thank you all, and goodbye. Riemann hypothesis checkmate, farewell. As Peter watched the digits scroll by, he felt a chill run down his spine. Could it really be this simple? Had this boy cracked a code that the brightest minds in mathematics had spent centuries trying to protect, the video ended abruptly, leaving Peter staring at the screen in stunned silence. This kid, this kid had potentially stumbled onto something monumental, something that could revolutionize mathematics but also wreak havoc on the world's most secure systems. Peter closed his laptop and sat back, his mind spinning. He needed to think. If this boy had truly cracked prime factorization, it meant the encryption protecting everything from bank accounts to government secrets was suddenly vulnerable. This was no longer just about mathematics, it was about the safety and stability of the digital world. By evening, Peter's worst fears materialized. 
What had started as a niche YouTube video quickly escalated into a global crisis. The news channels were in a frenzy, with every major network covering the story. BBC, CNN, and others reported on the shocking development that had thrown the digital world into chaos. The prime factorization breakthrough was no longer just a mathematical curiosity, it had become a full-blown security nightmare. Peter watched in disbelief as BBC aired a segment titled Global Security Breach, Prime Factorization Algorithm Cracked. The reporter stood in front of a screen displaying images of bank accounts, social media profiles, and government databases, all compromised. Nations across the globe were reeling, especially those using encryption protocols based on smaller prime numbers. Countries with weaker encryption, relying on older or low-bit key primes, were the hardest hit. Sensitive data was leaking, and financial losses were skyrocketing. The news anchor gravely announced, reports are coming in that billions of dollars have been stolen, identities have been hijacked, and national security systems have been breached. Governments are scrambling to secure their systems, but the damage is already done. As Peter sat in stunned silence, his phone buzzed with notifications. He glanced at the screen, emails, news alerts, messages from colleagues. Everyone was talking about the same thing, the prime factorization crisis. The Senate in the United States had passed an emergency motion to investigate the situation. An expert panel was being formed, comprised of top mathematicians, cryptographers, and cybersecurity specialists. Their task was to probe how this had happened and, more importantly, how to stop it. Peter knew what that meant. They would be reviewing encryption methods, revisiting fundamental mathematical assumptions, and scrutinizing the impact of this newfound method of prime factorization. It was no longer just about protecting digital assets, it was about ensuring that the very infrastructure of the modern world didn't collapse. One news ticker caught Peter's eye, International Cyber Task Force assembled to respond to prime crisis. Global cooperation was unfolding at a rapid pace, with countries joining forces to mitigate the threat. Peter's mind raced as he thought about the implications. How had a seemingly obscure video on a small YouTube channel triggered such a monumental event, and more importantly, how had this kid, who claimed to be an amateur with only accounting-level math, stumbled upon something so profound that it shook the foundations of cryptography worldwide? The world was in chaos, and Peter knew that this crisis would reshape not only mathematics but the future of global security. Peter sank back into his chair, the weight of the situation pressing on him. He knew exactly how these expert committees operated. They were composed of brilliant minds, but their solutions were rarely immediate. In a crisis of this magnitude, the world needed more than just a theoretical resolution, it needed an antidote, something to patch the hole in the global security infrastructure until a permanent fix could be devised. He thought about the discussions that must have already started behind closed doors. The experts would likely propose adding an extra layer of encryption or scrambling techniques to protect data from this new prime factorization hack. But implementing such a solution would be an immense challenge. The big IT companies, Google, Apple, Microsoft, IBM, would undoubtedly spearhead these efforts. They had the resources, the talent, and the infrastructure to roll out these security updates swiftly. And, of course, they would generate enormous revenue from it. Corporations and governments alike would pay handsomely for emergency protection. But Peter's thoughts shifted to the millions of individual users who didn't have the luxury of corporate IT departments shielding their data. Who would help them? The everyday person with a smartphone or a personal computer, who used online banking, stored their photos in the cloud, and depended on digital security, what would become of them? The big tech companies would focus on their largest clients, leaving the smaller users vulnerable. Hackers would exploit this window of vulnerability, knowing full well that individual users were often the weakest link in the security chain. Phishing attacks, data breaches, stolen identities, it was only going to get worse before it got better. Peter couldn't help but feel a pang of frustration. The situation was spiraling out of control, and while the experts and tech giants might eventually develop a fix, there was no immediate solution for the average person. What was needed was a grassroots effort, something to protect individual users quickly and effectively, even if it wasn't perfect. But who would lead that charge? Peter felt a growing sense of dread. If the boy's claims about exponential and logarithmic functions being fundamentally linked to zero were true, then the implications were staggering. Numbers, once the bedrock of encryption, might no longer be secure as keys. This was checkmate. For decades, the world had relied on the supposed unbreakability of large prime numbers and their role in encryption algorithms. But now, if this new method exposed the vulnerability of those numbers, the very concept of using numbers as passwords or cryptographic keys could be rendered obsolete. Peter couldn't shake the boy's words, everything is linked to zero. 
If zero was at the core of all exponential and logarithmic functions, and if the prime factorization could be cracked through some kind of hidden pattern, then it meant that no numerical key was truly safe anymore. It was as if the entire field of cryptography had been appended overnight. He stared blankly at his computer screen, his mind racing with possibilities. What would the world turn to now? Biometrics, quantum cryptography, but these solutions were still years away from being practical for widespread use. The realization hit him hard, humanity's reliance on numbers for security had become its greatest vulnerability. And what made this situation worse was that it was all happening so fast. There wasn't enough time to switch to a new method of securing data. Even if quantum encryption became mainstream tomorrow, the damage had already been done. Existing passwords, keys, and algorithms were exposed, and the world was defenseless against this newly discovered weakness. The magnitude of the crisis was unlike anything Peter had ever imagined. It wasn't just banks, governments, and companies that were at risk, it was every single person who had ever used a password or secured data online. As he processed these thoughts, Peter realized something else, this was more than just a mathematical breakthrough. It was a paradigm shift. The rules that had governed digital security for decades were no longer valid. He could feel the world moving into uncharted territory. It was a race against time to find new ways to secure information, but the traditional reliance on numbers as the ultimate safeguard was coming to an end. Peter sighed heavily, thinking about the timing of it all. The world had barely begun to recover from the devastating aftershocks of the COVID pandemic. Economies were still fragile, people were adjusting to new ways of life, and governments were grappling with the long-term effects of the crisis. And now this, a blow to the very foundation of global security, had emerged seemingly out of nowhere. This wasn't just another technological challenge, it was far bigger than the Y2K problem that had caused widespread panic at the turn of the millennium. Back then, the issue had been clear, a simple bug in the system that could be addressed with time and effort. Companies and governments had poured resources into fixing it, and in the end, disaster had been averted. But this, this was different. The Y2K problem had been a known issue with a clear deadline. There had been time to prepare, plan, and implement solutions. The entire world had banded together to ensure that, when the clock struck midnight on the 1st of January 2000, the lights would stay on, and the world would continue as usual. The real danger had been averted. But here, there was no warning, no preparation. This was a surprise attack, a mathematical bomb dropped on the world. And the fallout was going to be catastrophic. Most countries weren't prepared for this kind of threat. Many had spent years investing in digital infrastructure without truly understanding the vulnerabilities inherent in their systems. They had become overconfident, trusting in encryption as a foolproof safeguard. Now, as the reality of the situation sank in, governments were scrambling to respond, but they were woefully unprepared. The implications of this breach were unimaginable. It wasn't just banks and governments that were at risk. Medical records, national security data, infrastructure control systems, power grids, all of these could be compromised. Lives could be at stake. If critical systems were hacked, it could lead to chaos and even loss of life. This wasn't just a theoretical threat, it was a clear and present danger. Peter thought about the millions of small businesses, families, and individuals who had been thrust into the digital world in the wake of COVID. They were the most vulnerable now. People who had just begun to trust in online banking, remote work, and digital communication were suddenly at risk of losing everything. The world wasn't just facing a technological problem, it was facing a crisis of confidence. The echoes of the pandemic still reverberated through society, and now this security disaster threatened to send shockwaves through every aspect of modern life. Peter could see the headlines forming in his mind, global cyber crisis, the world's second great lockdown, people had endured lockdowns, isolation, and economic turmoil. But now, they might have to face a new kind of lockdown, a digital one. Peter remembered the final lines from the boy's paper, which now felt hauntingly prophetic, I wanted to take this algorithm with me, bury it in the infinity of numbers where it belonged. But then, I thought, isn't that what science is all about? Knowing the unknown? If this knowledge disrupts the world, am I really to blame? The pursuit of truth is unstoppable. The boy had wrestled with the moral implications of his discovery, and in a way, Peter couldn't blame him. The line between genius and destruction had always been thin in the world of science. Many of the greatest breakthroughs had been double-edged swords, capable of both improving and destroying lives. This young man had unlocked something extraordinary, something that would challenge the very fabric of mathematics, cryptography, and digital security. But instead of hiding it, he had chosen to reveal it, leaving the world to grapple with the consequences. In his mind, he wasn't responsible for what happened next. 
Science was about pushing boundaries, asking questions, and accepting the consequences. Peter reflected on the boy's decision. Could he really be held accountable? After all, history was full of examples where scientific discoveries had outpaced society's ability to control them. Oppenheimer had once said after the creation of the atomic bomb, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Yet, the bomb had been built regardless, and the world had changed forever. Was this boy any different? He had found a weakness in the system and exposed it. The world wasn't ready, but was it ever truly ready for such leaps? Peter felt a strange mix of admiration and unease. The boy's discovery was a monumental breakthrough, but it was also a harbinger of chaos. This wasn't just a mathematical achievement, it was a societal reckoning. The world was going to have to catch up, to find new ways to secure itself, to protect the digital foundations of modern life. But Peter also knew that this crisis wasn't just about finding a technical solution. It was a test of humanity's ability to adapt. The boy had thrown down the gauntlet, and now it was up to everyone, mathematicians, cryptographers, governments, and tech companies, to rise to the challenge. The stakes were incredibly high. If the world failed to respond adequately, it could lead to a collapse of trust in digital systems, setting humanity back decades in terms of technological progress. On the other hand, if this challenge sparked new innovations, it could lead to a renaissance of cryptography, with methods far more secure than anything that had come before. Peter knew what he had to do. He couldn't sit idly by and let others tackle this problem. The boy had opened the door to a new world, and it was up to people like Peter to step through it and make sure humanity came out the other side intact. He picked up the phone and dialed the number of an old colleague, someone deeply embedded in the field of cryptography. We need to talk, he said, as the call connected. Peter's friend on the other end of the line took a deep breath, absorbing the gravity of the situation. If what you're saying is true, Peter, then we're facing a crisis unlike anything we've seen before. The only immediate solution might be radical, banning the manufacturing and sale of processors with computational power above the threshold capable of breaking RSA encryption. We could limit response times to 30 seconds or less at the user end, making real-time attacks much harder to pull off, and increasing the key size, maybe by another hundred orders of magnitude. Peter could almost hear the gears turning in his friend's mind, weighing the options. But, his friend continued, all of that might just be temporary fixes, band-aids on a wound that's much deeper. We're talking about fundamentally rethinking how we handle encryption, data security, everything. And those measures? They would come with enormous trade-offs. You're right, Peter responded. Increasing key sizes will slow down everything. Banning certain processors would send shockwaves through the tech industry, and not just for high-end computers. Even everyday devices would be impacted. Limiting response times could cripple user experience. The economic impact would be enormous, but what choice do we have? His friend paused before responding. The thing is, Peter, encryption is built on trust, on the idea that certain problems, like factoring large primes, are too hard to solve quickly. If that's no longer true, then encryption as we know it is dead. We'd be entering a new era of digital insecurity. But here's the kicker, it's not just about technology anymore, it's about public perception. People need to believe their data is safe, or they'll stop using digital services altogether. That's the real danger, losing faith in the system. Peter nodded, even though his friend couldn't see him. The world's digital infrastructure was already fragile after COVID, Peter said. This could be the final push that shatters it. But we need to act fast. If this boy's algorithm spreads, if people start exploiting it. He trailed off, the implications too overwhelming to finish the thought. His friend was silent for a moment before replying, we have to get ahead of this. We need the brightest minds working on a solution right now, and governments need to know that this is a crisis, not just another hack. I'll reach out to the security experts I know, and we'll get an emergency summit going. But Peter, this isn't just about solving the problem. This is about managing the fallout. We need to start thinking beyond the immediate fix. Peter sighed, I'll do what I can on my end. We'll have to brief the media carefully, panic won't help anyone. But the clock is ticking. We might have weeks, days, or even hours before this goes completely global. I'll send you everything I've got on this. Let's hope we're not too late. As Peter hung up the phone, he realized just how much was at stake. The boy's algorithm had exposed vulnerabilities that could potentially bring the world's digital economy to its knees. Stopping the spread was only the beginning, finding a long-term solution would require a complete overhaul of the way encryption was understood and applied. He stood up from his desk, looking out the window at the world outside. Everything seemed so calm, so ordinary, but Peter knew that beneath the surface, the cracks were beginning to show. 
and this time, humanity might not have the luxury of simply patching them up. The next day, as the sun rose over the financial districts of the world, the headlines were already ablaze with news of the market downturn. All major indexes, including the Nasdaq, opened 30% down. Panic rippled through the financial sector as investors scrambled to make sense of the situation. Some countries had already triggered circuit breakers, halting trading to prevent further crashes, but the damage was done. This wasn't just another market correction, this was fear. The kind of fear that paralyzed decision-making and sent shockwaves through the global economy. The news of the prime factorization breakthrough had spread like wildfire, and speculation about its consequences fueled the sell-off. Financial institutions, tech giants, and governments were all reeling. Hackers and crackers saw an opportunity. They flooded the dark web, forums, and encrypted channels, sharing methods to exploit the algorithm, finding weaknesses in systems that were previously considered unbreakable. It was a feeding frenzy. Many who had once worked respectable nine to five jobs in the tech industry were now abandoning their desks, seeing a once in a lifetime chance to make a quick fortune through illicit means. Digital heists skyrocketed overnight. Everything from personal bank accounts to corporate databases was under attack. Companies that prided themselves on their digital security were suddenly vulnerable, and no one knew how far the damage would go. Even cryptocurrency exchanges, which relied on the presumed security of cryptographic keys, were hit hard as wallets were drained in record time. Peter watched the chaos unfold on the news. Images of traders with their heads in their hands, global leaders in emergency meetings, and news anchors struggling to keep up with the latest developments flashed across the screen. The world had been caught off guard, and the response was sluggish. Governments were announcing new regulations, and big tech companies were scrambling to implement emergency patches, but there was no quick fix. His phone buzzed with messages from colleagues and friends in the industry. Everyone was asking the same questions, how do we stop this, and what happens next? It's like watching society unravel in real time, Peter thought grimly. The kid's algorithm had thrown humanity into a new kind of crisis, one that was shaking the very foundations of digital trust and security. The economy wasn't just faltering, it was under siege. Peter's friend called again, sounding more desperate this time. Peter, it's worse than we thought. Every sector is affected, finance, healthcare, even government systems are starting to show vulnerabilities. Some major corporations are talking about pulling the plug on their entire digital infrastructure until they can guarantee it's safe. But that's not a solution, it's just running from the problem. We can't keep running, Peter replied. We need to start looking at completely new methods of encryption, something beyond prime factorization, maybe even beyond numbers. But that's going to take time, time we don't have. And what about the people? His friend asked. They are going to lose faith, Peter. Faith in the system, faith in their governments, in their institutions. We're not just dealing with a technical problem anymore, this is a societal collapse in the making. Peter nodded, though his friend couldn't see him. I know, we need to act fast, the experts are on it, but we need to keep the public calm. Panic won't help anyone right now. But deep down, Peter wasn't so sure. He knew the magnitude of the challenge ahead. The world had never faced a crisis like this before, and the solutions would have to be as radical as the problem itself. Peter sat in his office, staring blankly at his screen. Hopelessness seeped into him, a feeling he had never experienced in his long career. As a mathematician, he had faced complex problems, but this was different, this was the unraveling of the very world he had helped build. The dark web was flooded with R-powered neural networks feeding through APIs, automating the work of hackers. What was once a task requiring meticulous skill and patience could now be done in a matter of minutes with the help of these AI tools. And the dark web wasn't just a chaotic free-for-all, it had become organized, with sites offering profit-sharing models to attract more hackers. Join the game of self-destruction, Peter muttered to himself as he scrolled through one of the reports. More and more people were being lured into this dangerous new world, driven by the promise of easy money and the thrill of breaking into systems they had once considered untouchable. AI-enabled tools were learning from every successful breach, refining their algorithms, and making each subsequent attack more efficient. And the people behind these tools weren't just hackers, they were business people now, treating cybercrime like a service industry. Profit-sharing models meant that even small-time hackers could get a cut of the loot, incentivizing more and more people to join in. It was a perfect storm of greed and technology, and it was tearing through society like wildfire. Peter felt a profound sense of despair. The tools designed to advance civilization, AI, machine learning, and automation were now being used to destroy it. 
the very systems that once protected people and kept society running smoothly were being weaponized against them. His phone rang again. It was his friend, but Peter didn't pick up. What was there to say? He felt powerless. The world was spinning out of control, and the experts, the ones who were supposed to have the answers, were just as lost as everyone else. Peter closed his eyes, trying to calm his racing thoughts. Is this the end of the digital world as we know it? He wondered. Could humanity recover from this, or had they crossed a line that couldn't be uncrossed? He had always believed in the power of human ingenuity, but now, faced with this crisis, he wasn't so sure anymore. The dark web was evolving into something far more dangerous than anyone had anticipated. It was no longer just a hidden corner of the internet where illicit goods and services were traded, it had become a global network of destruction, fueled by AI, where profit-driven chaos reigned supreme. And the worst part? There seemed to be no way to stop it. As the cyber war escalated, the chaos spread beyond individual hackers targeting vulnerable systems. Nation-states began to enter the fray. What started as a cascade of breaches in financial systems and personal accounts morphed into a full-blown cross-border cyber war. Even the most secure and isolated nations, like China and North Korea, which had long prided themselves on their tight control over their digital borders, were not spared. Corporate giants from across the globe poured billions into cybersecurity, trying to stay ahead of the ever-evolving threats. But money alone wasn't enough. The hacker networks, now flush with resources, were relentless. They used their newfound wealth to fund more sophisticated attacks, pulling in the brightest minds with promises of quick fortunes and anonymity. It was a digital arms race, but this time, no one was winning. Soon, national infrastructures were under siege. Energy grids, telecommunications, water systems, and military networks, nothing was safe. Peter Reed reports of entire cities going dark, of critical medical supplies being delayed due to network failures, of panic spreading as citizens found themselves cut off from essential services. Even China's Great Firewall, long considered impenetrable, buckled under the sheer volume of attacks. The North Korean servers, often touted as the most isolated in the world, were compromised as well. Their state-controlled internet was no match for the coordinated assaults launched by hackers who no longer feared retaliation. These isolated regimes, once untouchable behind their digital curtains, now faced the same vulnerability as the rest of the world. The cyber war had evolved into a global digital conflict, and no one was safe. The cross-border nature of the attacks made it impossible to trace their origins. Hackers in one country would launch attacks through servers in another, masking their tracks in layers of encrypted code and rerouting through compromised networks across continents. Digital alliances were formed in the dark corners of the web, where hackers from different nations collaborated to exploit weaknesses in systems they once considered enemies. Even the most isolated and secure regimes were now caught in the crossfire, scrambling to patch vulnerabilities in their systems. But it was too late. The damage had been done. The world's digital infrastructure was unraveling faster than anyone could contain it. And in the middle of it all, Peter knew that the chaos had been sparked by a single, seemingly small crack in the foundation, the discovery of an algorithm that rendered prime factorization obsolete. As days turned into weeks, the world watched helplessly as the cracks in its IT infrastructure deepened. No expert committees could patch the critical vulnerabilities. They tried, countless meetings, emergency sessions, and task forces were formed, but the problem ran too deep. The loophole was now a gaping chasm, and nothing they proposed could restore the lost security. Big companies, recognizing the inevitable collapse of classical computing, doubled down on their quantum computing projects. Billions of dollars poured into quantum research, but these efforts were still years from bearing fruit. In the meantime, the digital world continued to erode. Governments, slow to react and bogged down by bureaucracy, only exacerbated the situation with half-hearted measures that did little to stem the tide. The global IT infrastructure, once seen as the backbone of modern civilization, began to crumble. Servers failed, data was lost, and communication networks collapsed. Ordinary people found themselves cut off from the services they relied on, while businesses went under, unable to secure their assets in the face of constant attacks. As the old world of classical computing crumbled, quantum computing began to rise from its ashes. But it was too little, too late. The remnants of classical systems lay in ruins, and the transition to quantum technology was chaotic at best. Societies fractured, economies crashed, and the digital revolution that had once promised to bring humanity together instead left it more divided than ever. The world witnessed a sea change unlike anything in history. The promises of quantum computing, greater speed, unbreakable encryption, seemed like distant hopes amid the chaos. 
In the end, the digital utopia people had envisioned turned out to be a fragile illusion, shattered by one fatal flaw in the very mathematics that underpinned it all. The new world would be built on the ruins of the old, but for now, all that remained was a landscape of broken systems and shattered trust.